Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for attending our seminar and webinar today. Um, this is uh, Gunawan. Uh, I'm head of research with Philip Securities Indonesia. And uh, today we are going to share our thoughts and our views about uh, the election year and its impact to Indonesian market. Um, Indonesian right now are paying attention to two major events. Well, firstly, uh, the World Cup and then uh, our presidential election. Uh, today we're going to talk about the later and share our views about the election year and the effect to our market. Okay, uh, this is um, the parliamentary election results uh, conducted on uh, 9th of April this year, where Joko Widodo's Democratic Party of Struggle, or we call it PDIP, won uh, roughly almost 19% of the popular vote. And then uh, the party of functional groups, uh, Golkar, uh, won almost 15%. And Prabowo's uh, Gerinda Party uh, secured uh, more than 11% of the popular vote. Um, the minimum requirement uh, for uh, a party to win a seat in the House of Representatives is 3.5%. So that's why these two parties, PBB and PKPI, uh, didn't get into the House of Representatives. And since uh, there is also a minimum uh, of 25% of the popular vote, uh, required in the legislative election to give uh, political parties the power to nominate presidential candidates. Uh, parties have uh, been forming coalitions or alliances uh, with both Gerindra Party, uh, Gerindra is a party uh, led by Prabowo Subianto, and then uh, PDIP Party or the Democratic Party of Struggle, uh, which presidential candidate is Joko Widodo. And in our view, um, there are quite a bit of differences um, between uh, the two candidates. Uh, this is our view. It doesn't necessarily uh, hold to the public's view or uh, you know, uh, parallel with uh, other views. Uh, we see that uh, Prabowo uh, is, in general, a supporter of nationalism. Well, uh, Jokowi or Jokowi Dodo is more op uh, has more open attitudes towards uh, foreign investment, and um, in terms of um, national uh, view, uh, the political view, Prabowo uh, is leans more towards a nationalist right political view, while Jokowi is a more moderate left uh, political figure. Um, also, uh, in their plans to develop Indonesia as a country, we see that Prabowo has a top-down approach to develop the country, which means that he believes uh, to develop Indonesia always starts from the top, uh, which is uh, the government, and then uh, going down to the people. While uh, Jokowi has different approach that we know, that he's le he leans more uh, to the approach that uh, he believes uh, people are more important to be developed first than uh, going up to the leaders. Now, um, these are the uh, campaign vision and mission submitted by both candidates when uh, they, uh, uh, they submitted themselves as presidential candidates. And we see that, in general, Prabowo and uh, his vice presidents Hatta uh, vision and mission are more specific but not necessarily uh, effective later. Uh, on the other hand, Jokowi and Yusuf Kala's plan are less if, uh, specific but could be more effective uh, in Indonesia later. And also um, there is of their overlapping uh, vision and mission from these uh, two pairs of uh, candidates uh, in some areas such as the uh, infrastructure uh, sector where 
both wants to build new roads about 2000 uh, to 3000 kilometers of new road now these are overlapping uh, policy plan uh, from uh, both uh, side of candidates and Indonesia now faces uh, two major economic challenges the first one is a slowing growth in economy uh, which uh, grew only uh, below 6% last year, 5.78%. And then for this year, we still expect below 6% growth for Indonesia, which is 58 to 5.9%. And the second issue is uh, the current account deficit, uh, which uh, was you know, uh, widened last month. But uh, And then uh, the bank, uh, the central bank, said that they maintain the interest rate at 7.5 percent yesterday uh, to keep the current uh, account deficit in check uh, our expectation for ca deficit this year uh, is still deficit we wouldn't uh, expect a surplus in current account we expect a deficit of uh, between 2.3 to 2.6 percent for 2014 still in uh, macro view uh, this is uh, indonesia's largest trade partners uh, the large five is china uh, the eurozone united states japan and india so uh, singapore is the sixth uh, largest trade partners with indonesia so um, our exports uh, basically can be uh, divided into two major categories the first one is the oil and gas export and then the second one is the non-oil and gas exports, uh, which includes uh, consumer goods. Uh, export for non-oil and gas uh, commodities. The largest is to China, almost 13% of the total exports. And then to the EU, and then uh, the US, Japan, India, and Singapore. So uh, hence, uh, China, EU, and US economic conditions have significant impact on uh, our economy and uh, our threat balance looking uh, further to our composite index uh, it's called the jakarta composite index this is the broad benchmark index of indonesian stocks while uh, the blue chip index are under uh, an index called the lq45 index which comprises of 45 blue chip index this one is uh, the broad index now um, it's it has a positive correlation with the MSCI Asia Pacific index which excludes Japan okay and uh, in the past three election years it has performed uh, quite extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily uh, with almost 72 percent uh, performance in 1999 when 1999 was the first uh, democratic election for Indonesia although at the time we didn't uh, elect any president we only elect uh, the parliament uh, members at the time because that was the first election uh, after Suharto era and then uh, the JCI <coughs> was uh, up 42% in 2004 we held uh, we hold our election every five years instead of four years, and then in two thousand and nine, the JCI uh, climbed seventy six percent. Now, uh, note that uh, past performance, of course, uh, will not necessarily uh, reflect future performance. But our expectation for uh, this year, since this is also an election year for Indonesia, uh, is basically quite a bit. So we expect uh, the Jakarta Composite Index to climb uh, about 24% to 5,300. Right now it's below 5,400, 4,900 and so on. Uh, this assumption is based on our EPS growth assumption of uh, almost 11.5%. The EPS or earning per share is about uh, two for, uh, 254 rupiah uh, per share. Uh, this is our forecast for this year uh, and the PE assumption is 20.86%. Uh, so far, yes, uh, sure.
uh, it's not general. Uh, it's actually the first trading day of that year to the last trading day of uh, the year. So it's from let's say uh, 2009 is from 5th of January, which which was the first trading day that year to 30th of December 2009. So it's a year to date, year to date figure. Uh, first trading day would be this year. I think it's the second or the third, the second or the third of January. Uh, so far, our index uh, climb almost twenty percent from uh, first trading day of this year to uh, yesterday. I think it's about eighteen or nineteen something percent year to date. Yeah. So uh, I'm also going to uh, mention. Uh, uh, kind of uh, you know the pattern the pattern in election year yeah, in this uh, in this uh, presentation now so uh, this is the general pattern of election year although uh, this pattern might not necessarily uh, be the same from one election year to the other but we see ge in general there are a few uh, things that we can summarize from uh, the JCA performance during the three last election. The pink one is uh, the 1999 election rescaled to 2009. Uh, the red one underneath is uh, the, the uh, 2004 election year, uh, the JCA performance, and then the blue one is 2009. So um, <clears throat> they all start in the, at the same point. Uh, we rescale it to the same point, and then uh, we saw that uh, before the election year in Indonesian market, there's a tendency that uh, investors would have uh, priced in the market since the beginning of the year. So uh, just like this year, since January, uh, f first trading day of January until uh, today, the JCA has climbed almost 20%. So since investors uh, knew that Oh, this is election year in Indonesia. They already priced in probably I'm not sure, but probably half of their investment or half of their their uh, uh, investment allocation for Indonesian stock. Uh, at least half, I think, uh, has been invested since the beginning of the year. And then uh, the second uh, tendency that we can observe here is that after the uh, presidential election, there is also a tendency to uh, for a continuing uh, continued uh, climb in the JCI, but before the election date, uh, this year is the on the 9th of July. Uh, last election, 2009, was on the 8th of July. There's a bit of hesitation, as you can see, from uh, 2008, uh, 2009, and also 2004, before the presidential election date. Uh, in 2004, the presidential election. Uh, was held in two rounds because uh, I think there was a swing votes, swing voters that uh, couldn't be resolved, so they held it in two rounds. But this year we estimate that, uh, and it seems more likely that it will be only one round of presidential election for Indonesia. And hence, uh, we see that uh, there is a tendency for the JCI to climb exponentially before the presidential election like this year quite exponentially and then after the presidential election whoever got elected uh, the JCI will climb, climb more steadily after the uh, election date but this again are uh, past performance in the last three years we can use this uh, to, uh, to 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 look at uh, the pattern of uh, our index or stock index uh, in election year but uh, then again uh, every election year is different so we cannot uh, you know ascertain that this year would be the same pattern as uh, the, uh, the election years before but this is quite indicative of uh, what's going to happen in Indonesian market this year and then uh, this is uh, the one that we mentioned before that uh, year to date in 2014, the JCI, the blue one here, uh, has performed relatively above other peers. Uh, this is S&P uh, 500 and then Dow Jones Industrial Index, the Nikkei 225 and the Hang Seng Index. 
but uh, PE wise is not uh, the cheapest also the PE stood at uh, last uh, on 6th of June we because we prepared this material on the 6th of June the PE on the 6th was uh, almost 21 times and uh, dividends reinvested was 15.7 uh, times while if we compare the PE uh, of SLP on the same date was 19 times uh, Dow Jones uh, was even cheaper at 16 times Nikkei uh, almost the same at 19 times and then uh, the Hang Seng was among the cheapest at 10 times PE so uh, with the good performance also comes uh, price uh, in the uh, the equity price also went up and the PE is no longer cheap at the moment but looking at the pattern in election year that we believe uh, PE and uh, not PE but the composite index in general will perform quite well uh, this year hence uh, our target for the JCI this year is 5,300 or 24% uh, year to date climb Uh, that will vary for the JCI, is it? Okay. Uh, that will vary from year to year. Uh, I can't recall uh, every year's PE, but uh, if you want to, we can look up for you the data later. And uh, digging deeper to a uh, stock sector that we think and we, uh, we expect will benefit from election momentum uh, first of all, the infrastructure sector and then the construction sector and uh, following the construction sector is the basic industry sector. Now, uh, why we think that these three sectors uh, will benefit from uh, election momentum? Because uh, apparently after uh, a new government is elected, usually they will uh, spend more in infrastructure uh, construction. This is uh, the case in Indonesia because they want to show that uh, okay we, we are newly elected we can work and then we, uh, we're going to develop a lot of infrastructure for you and so on so that's why we, we expect uh, infrastructure spending to go up uh, whoever got elected uh, in this election and uh, following infrastructure would be the construction sector because they're the one uh, to work on this infrastructure project and since construction sector got business and then uh, cement industry, uh, which is in the basic industry sector, uh, cement uh, comprises a large part of basic industry sector in Indonesia, uh, will follow with a, a quite a good uh, performance uh, this year and in 2015, uh, as far as we uh, estimate. So uh, this is the index of infrastructure sector and basic uh, industry sector. Uh, which uh, PBV was two point, uh, almost 2.6 times for infrastructure, utilities and transportation while basic industry uh, which comprises uh, of uh, the, I mean in, in terms of market cap uh, cement companies has a large part in basic industry uh, the PBV last time was 2.54 uh, times And since we are talking about uh, infrastructure, we uh, today we also want to highlight a few uh, stocks. Uh, one stock, sorry, one stock in infrastructure, the telecommunication stock, and then later there's a cement stock uh, we we wish to highlight also, and then uh, there's an automotive uh, stock we want to uh, present also in this presentation. Um, we start up with. The uh, telecommunication Indonesia. This is a large cap stock in Indonesian market. Uh, it's owned by uh, the state, more than fifteen percent, fifty percent. Sorry, yep. the government of Indonesia own more than fifty percent, while the public owns forty eight point eight percent. Now, uh, telecom is a dominant player in uh, telecommunication industry in Indonesia. Now, the market share uh, is about forty five to fifty percent of mobile phone subscribers. It has uh, four major segments, the telecommunication and then information and the media and ed uh, entertainment and then services. Uh, back to the first slide. Our recommendation uh, for telecom is uh, accumulate, not a buy recommendation, <coughs> with a fair value of 
uh, for 2014 at 2,431 rupiah. Now this uh, fair value reflects a PE ratio of 14 times 4 times uh, compared to PE of 15 times 2 times at the end of last year. Uh, since uh, we haven't uh, finished the updates on uh, this company, uh, we used the 9 month 13 uh, data uh, so far. Uh, which showed that revenue uh, for Telcom grew 8.2% and uh, its cellular subsidiary recorded a 10.4% year-on-year revenue growth to 43.9 trillion rupiah. Uh, this company has quite high debt-to-equity ratio, uh, but it decreased last year to 6.3% from, uh, sorry, by 6.3% to 27.4 percent but uh, the positive side for telco is that telcom is that uh, it has stable margin uh, operating margin <coughs> was steady at 16 percent and uh, gross profit margin was quite steady at around 48 to 49 percent now uh, it's uh, data internet and IT services revenue increased 7.8 percent Q on Q in third Q uh, last year. Now this is uh, Telcom's market share in nine months 2013. Uh, subscriber wise, Telcom, uh, T-Cell is a Telcom, uh, a Telcom subsidiary. Uh, it has 127.9 million subscriber. Uh, and then uh, second is XL, another company has 50, over 58 million subscriber or 18% market share. And then Indosat or ISAT has 53.8 million uh, subscriber. Uh, total uh, cellular subscriber in Indonesia, the last data that we gathered is uh, 315 million subscriber. Now, if you uh, see that our population uh, doesn't reach that much, uh, probably yet, but uh, 315 subscriber means that one person in Indonesia subscribed to more than one service provider or one has has one more than one mobile phone or mobile phone number so that's why uh, our population is about 200 million right now so uh, but the sub number of cell phone subscriber are 315 million so that's why the number is larger than the population itself uh, a few keys for investing in Telkom or TLKM uh, IJ for Bloomberg ticker uh, is that uh, in telecommunication industry in Indonesia, especially for fixed line telephone revenues, uh, is actually declining in revenues and in ARPU or in uh, average revenue per user. This is due to tighter competitions and more. Uh, uh, more players are more willing to reduce or discount uh, their subscription prices. And the second one is financial risk, where Telkine has higher debt. This is due to borrowing uh, to finance its operation. And then interest rate, of course, uh, would be another risk in investing for Telkom. And then lastly is a legal risk, where uh, price, uh, fixed price uh, of telecommunication services uh, are important to avoid legalist or legal consequences. Uh, what this means is that uh, since uh, telecommunication Indonesia is uh, the major shareholder for the company is the Indonesian government, they cannot uh, fiercely compete in prices with other competitors as well. This is uh, due to the government's regulation that set a range of uh, prices for uh, telecommunication services in the country so that's why they, they cannot compete otherwise they'll they'll be uh, you know it will be illeg uh, illegal for them to charge let's say uh, much lower prices to consumers this is our last rating for uh, telecommunication Indonesia uh, last was uh, before was not rated and uh, last was rated accumulate uh, and then the target price was 2431 for Telcom. Moving on, uh, 
for construction sector, uh, we mentioned before that uh, in this election year, construction would benefit from uh, the election momentum. Here we compare a few construction uh, companies in Indonesia, which include Adi is Adi Karya, and then uh, WSKT is Waskita Karya, and then Wika is Vijaya Karya. Everything with Karya has to do with construction in Indonesia because Karya means work. So uh, if you see a, a issuer from Indone Indonesian issuer has Karya Karya, most likely it's a construction company. And then PTPP is uh, another construction company. And then uh, SSIA and Total Construction. Uh, we compare this uh, based on uh, the data we have on uh, the 9th of June. Uh, so PE-wise, uh, sorry, there's no PE here. Okay. Now, uh, average uh, revenue growth rate, if we see uh, the average growth rate for construction sector, the average is 16.53% year on year. So there are a few companies that exceeded uh, this revenue growth rate, uh, uh, PTPP and SSIA. And margin-wise, uh, net profit margin is uh, at around 6% average. And uh, SSIA again and Total again has uh, higher net profit margin than the industry average uh, in overall. In terms of return of uh, on equity, <coughs> the average is almost 24%. Uh, Adi Karya has uh, return on equity high, well above its average, and also uh, Total has uh, an above uh, return on equity above the average and uh, SSI also. So uh, we can uh, conclude from uh, this quite simple table that um, two, two of these construction company actually has been performing, uh, at least in the last year, has been performing quite well. If you uh, compare it to other uh, construction companies, despite the fact that Adi Karya uh, and then WSKT and then Wika uh, are controlled by the government or uh, largely government-owned construction companies. Now, these three uh, below, the PTPP and SSIA and Total, are private companies, uh, public companies, but owned by private uh, firms. Yeah, sure. Mm. Jaffa, correct. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. Uh, there's a question from our attendee here about uh, since Indonesia is an archipelagic um, uh, country, uh, is the economic uh, centralized in uh, Jaffa? We would say that yes, it's uh, mostly centralized in Jaffa, particularly in Jakarta. So that's one of the major challenges for Indonesia as well, because. Uh, Unless uh, we can uh, decentralize the economy to other large area that, uh, especially the more remote area, uh, let's say if uh, they, they develop uh, more cities in those remote area, I'm sure that uh, the economic uh, picture in overall will improve for Indonesia. But now, uh, since it is uh, concentrated in Jaffa, West Jaffa and in Jakarta and it's, uh, the surrounding uh, Jakarta area. Uh, problems like uh, infrastructure, construction, and then uh, distribution and logistics arises because everything is centralized in Jakarta. So uh, traffic jam will cause delays in logistic and distribution of goods. And uh, also uh, the city itself probably uh, is not well developed to uh, to buffer or to cater for uh, economic growth, the national economic growth. So yes, the answer is yes. It's, right now it's quite centrally, very centralized in Jakarta and Java. Okay, okay. Uh, moving on, next slide is about uh, Pegas. Probably uh, some of us has known uh, this uh, listed company. Uh, Pegas is Perusahaan Gas Negara, which is again a state-owned company uh, in gas industry, uh, which distribute gas uh, to consumers. Uh, <coughs> we attempt to compare uh, this company, Pegas, uh, 
this one perusahaan gas negara to other uh, similar companies uh, listed all over uh, Asia particularly uh, which include uh, Tenaga Nasional uh, in Malaysia and then uh, Power Grid Corp in India and then Manila Electric Company and so on and uh, Pegas is actually one of the largest uh, company in this segment with a market cap of over uh, 11 billion uh, US dollar so it's actually uh, the third largest in this comparison by market cap and then uh, the EV EBITDA but the EV EBITDA is quite high uh, more than 10 and then uh, PE ratio for 2014 estimate our estimate is about uh, 12.44 times almost above uh, almost reaching the average uh, of this uh, industry at 12.84 times um, but then again if we look at all of them uh, most of them has quite high PE above uh, 10 already right now uh, in terms of dividend uh, Prusan gas has quite good dividend payout ratio at about 50.34 percent compared to its peers except for Manila Electric Company uh, which has 69 percent dividend payout ratio and uh, perhaps for uh, Aboitis Equity Ventures which has 44 47 percent uh, DPR uh, compared to the average of 40.64% DPR. Okay, um, now we move on to the second company that we want to uh, highlight in this presentation is uh, Cement Indonesia or SMGR. Now, uh, our recommendation uh, for this company is buy with the target price for end of 2014 is 18,000 rupiah uh, the target price implies uh, expected PE ratio of 15.4 times this year uh, compared to the PE of 16.8 times at the end of last year uh, we use discounted cash flow method to derive at this valuation uh, we assume that revenue would grow 20% this year and 18.3% uh, next year and net income of cement Indonesia to grow uh, more than 17% this year and 18% uh, next year uh, with the average, uh, weighted average uh, cost of capital at 11.3% and beta of 1.04 uh, about cement Indonesia uh, it used to uh, be called cement Gresik if uh, some of us may uh, recall that it used to be called cement Gresik but uh, lately, uh, not long ago, the Indonesian government changed the name to Cement Indonesia. Uh, it is the largest cement producer in the country uh, with four, almost 44% market share uh, in Indonesia. <coughs> and it is the parent company of four cement manufacturers, uh, which is Cement Padang, Cement Gresik, Cement Tonasa, and Tanglong Cement in Vietnam. Supporting uh, facilities and distribution network uh, <coughs> uh, spread out throughout Indonesia it's, uh, is one of uh, the strength of this company. <coughs> now the government owns 51% and the public owns almost 49%. Now this is uh, the map of uh, cement Indonesia's plants and facilities throughout, uh, to, uh, throughout Indonesia. It has 13 units of kiln and then uh, 22 units of cement mill, uh, 30 warehouses, 21 packing plant, and 11 seaport dedicated for cement distribution in Indonesia. So uh, this could be related to the previous question about uh, economic activity in Indonesia, which is centralized in Java Island. In this map alone, we can see that a lot of facilities are located in Java. It's very, very well concentrated and then followed by Sumatra and then the other areas in Indonesia. Well, this pretty much shows that uh, Java still dominates uh, economic activities in the country. Yeah, this is apart from, apart from cement Indonesia. Uh, the one in Vietnam uh, is uh, the Tang Long cement uh, in which they have uh, one cement mill. Oh, sorry, this one I think. Uh, yeah, this is Vietnam, sorry. Okay, a few uh, investment uh, merits for Cement Indonesia. 
Uh, beside the fact that it's, it is the leading uh, market player for cement uh, in the country with 44% market share, it also has the largest production capacity. And uh, despite its status as the largest, it still continues to expand for sustainable growth. Uh, the nature of cement industry in the country, in Indonesia, is not of uh, how to how to expand more than other competitors, but it is about how to expand to fulfill demand. So it's playing catching up with demand. It's not uh, like, you know, uh, we have to catch up with other competitors, no. We have to catch up with demand. That's the nature of uh, cement industry in Indonesia. So uh, cement companies in Indonesia uh, are still expanding their businesses and building more uh, meal, more uh, manufacturing facilities uh, to catch up with demands. In the long run, this industry uh, is a quite promising industry because Indonesia has a lot of room for growth still. We, need, we still need a lot of cement to build uh, infrastructure, to build houses and so on. A few risks uh, related to investing to, uh, in cement in Indonesia are, uh, first of all, foreign exchange risks, where 80% of the total plant investment costs goes toward processing uh, new machineries. Now, uh, Indonesian mostly purchase uh, manufacturing machineries from foreign countries. So weakness in the rupiah, of course, uh, poses uh, currency risks for this industry. The second is competition risk. Uh, in the next few years, we see that uh, the cement industry is poised to see greater competition with uh, incessant ex expansion of exi existing producers and introduction of new players. Although uh, the industry itself is a high barrier industry, uh, which means that not everybody can set up a cement plant easily than we, uh, let's say we set up retail shops uh, uh, company. Uh, this is a few financial, uh, key financial uh, figures of Cement Indonesia, where we forecast revenue uh, this year to grow to 29 uh, trillion, uh, 29.39 trillion rupiah, and then for 2015, uh, we forecast uh, growth of revenue to 34.76 trillion rupiah. And then uh, this table shows uh, the big cement players in Indonesia. Not only big, but this is all the, the cement players in Indonesia, uh, which is uh, led by cement Indonesia itself with a production capacity of almost 30 million tons uh, with 43.8% market share. And then uh, followed by Indo Cement Tunggal Prakasa with 20.5 million tons uh, production capacity or bear, uh, nearly 30% market share, and then wholesale Indonesia with 12.1 million tons capacity and 14.3% market share as of the first quarter of this year. And the others are still uh, uh, below the market share, uh, well below wholesale in the cement and uh, cement Indonesia. Uh, comparing these uh, cement manufacturing companies, we also can see it from a relative valuation point of view, where PE-wise, Cement Indonesia is not the most expensive. Relatively, uh, the three big players are uh, has you know uh, have PE of about 17 times, 16 to 17 times uh, at the moment. While for Cement Batu Raja, uh, this is the last, the newest listed cement company in Indonesia. I think it was listed uh, in 2013, last year, Cement Batu Raja, while the other three uh, has been listed uh, in Indonesia Stock Exchange for quite a long time. Uh, ROE-wise, Cement Indonesia has the largest return on equity. Uh, and then EBITDA margin uh, is below other competitors, like uh, especially uh, Cement Indo Cement, Indo Cement Tunggal Prakasa, and Cement Batu Raja. But 
uh, the average uh, we didn't include the average here sorry and uh, below is a uh, uh, other cement companies uh, in listed in other exchanges including Siam cement and then uh, Heidelberg cement in Germany and then the whole sim uh, cement company itself okay um, the third company and the last uh, listed company we want to uh, present to you today is not of the construction or the infrastructure company but uh, it is an automotive company uh, because we see that uh, this company Mitra Pinastika Mustika has a uh, growth potential in the future although right now it's a uh, it's, it's in a mid to small cap it's a mid to small cap company it's not a large cap company for uh, right now uh, our valuation for Mitra Pinastika is uh, 1613 rupiah for end of 2014 uh, and we recommend it buy for this company and uh, our investment approach is more of growth investing uh, long-term growth investing for uh, Mitra and then uh, revenue forecast basically is 29.5 percent to almost 18 trillion rupiah a few key drivers that we see uh, with drive will drive this company forward is that uh, recently it was granted uh, Nissan and Datsun distribution right from Nissan Indonesia. Now these new additions uh, to their portfolio uh, will lower the uh, lower the capex. I will explain later, but higher brand uh, presence in the country. Now uh, also the second driver is uh, the fact that uh, growth in automatic automatic transmission two wheeler in Indonesia is quite rapid. So the company has a uh, subsidiary in that, in that industry and then it also has uh, subsidiaries in auto financing industry and uh, also uh, the four wheel industry. Okay, we look into the detail about Mitra. <coughs> it is an automotive uh, firm. Uh, it was established in 1987 but was first listed on the Indonesian Stock Exchange last year, uh, 2013. Uh, primary two-wheeler market is in East Java. Uh, the company has 67% market share in that area. And then uh, it has four business segments, which is distribution and retail, and then uh, consumer parts, and then auto services and financial services. Uh, major shareholders are Saratoga Investment Sedaya, which is also the major shareholders for a uh, few other companies in Indonesia including Adaro Energy and uh, Power uh, Bersama and then uh, the second major seller is Morning Light Investment and the rest uh, of 37.5 percent is owned by the public. Um, the first business segment of MPMX is the distribution and retail segment in which the company uh, distribute two-wheel and four-wheel vehicle. Uh, this segment contributes to 43% of uh, the company's net uh, profit after tax and minority interest last year, or about uh, 77, uh, 67 rupiah per share. Now, uh, the subsidiaries for two-wheelers include NPM Distributor and then NPM Motor, uh, only two, two of them, sorry, uh, with, in which uh, NPM Motor is the fifth largest two-wheeler sales and service company. Sales volume uh, for two-wheeler last year grew 23%. Now that outperformed uh, the nationwide growth of 10%. For this year, uh, the estimate for two-wheeler is only 5 to 7%. Now this is uh, the company's management guidance, uh, which we believe is quite moderate or quite modest. Uh, if they set the guidance of only five to seven percent this year, and then uh, a few initiatives uh, for this segment from Mitra, uh, they are adding one more warehouse in East Java, and then they also stock up more inventories uh, ahead of the uh, festive season or the Lebaran season in Indonesia. In four wheel segment, uh, the subsidiary uh, the subsidiary is MPM Auto, uh, in which it has unique business models uh, 
it works like this. Uh, the the uh, apparently MPX um, partners with local dealers or local showrooms, so they don't build uh, their own uh, showrooms. As such, uh, this would lower the capex for the company to distribute cars because they don't have to build their own dealers. They don't have to spend the capex for that. And then uh, they part they partners with the uh, local dealers, and then they they can sell their cars uh, at those showrooms. The second uh, unique business model for distribution and retail segment is that uh, MPMX partners also with uh, financing companies outside their own financing firms. There are four uh, prominent financing companies uh, which has a partnership. Uh, scheme with uh, MPMX, which is PCA Finance. Uh, it has more than 3 million uh, or about 3 million customers in Indonesia. And then Adira Finance has about uh, 1.6 million customers, BFI Finance and Auto Multi Ata Finance. Uh, these are the four financing companies uh, to have uh, financing, uh, auto financing partnership with the company. Uh, in this partnership, the four prominent uh, financing companies uh, will provide MPMX with pre-approved uh, customer names. Pre-approved means that uh, they are credit worthy according to these four uh, financing firms. This is an advantage for MPMX because they don't have to screen this uh, screen these customers themselves. They will cost quite a bit of uh, uh, cost as well. And then uh, secondly. Uh, there would be uh, lower risk of non-performing loans for MPMX because uh, BCA Finance, Adira, BFI, and Auto Multi Arta uh, would have screened this customer first before they give uh, the customer names to MPMX. In return, this company would get uh, clients for auto financing, right? And then uh, for MPMX, they will get uh, auto sales from these financing companies. So that's why that's how the partnership works for uh, distribution and retail into two wheeler and four wheeler segment. Uh, this is a bit of a look into Indonesia's four wheel industry. Right now, Toyota brand uh, commands about thirty five percent of market share, followed by uh, Daihatsu with fifteen percent market share. Uh, this is two thousand and thirteen data. And then Suzuki with 13.3%, Mitsubishi with 12.8%, Honda commands 7.8% uh, of four-wheel market share, and lastly is Nissan about 5 to 6% of market share. Now the company, uh, we asked the company on the last management visit uh, to MPMX, since Nissan has only 5% of market share, right? So if uh, even if you're granted uh, Nissan and that soon distribution right from Nissan Indonesia. How would you compete with uh, other brands? And uh, the management answered that uh, they are aiming for to develop Nissan Indonesia to have a market share of more than six percent. In fact, they, they they want more market share for Nissan Indonesia. So I think uh, we think that uh, this company is quite serious uh, in distributing uh, Nissan cars in Indonesia. Moving on to uh, the second segment for MPMX is the uh, auto consumer parts. The company call it auto consumer parts, but it is actually a, a automotive lubricant uh, manufacturing. So they, they manufacture uh, these two wheel and four wheel lubricants for uh, automotive. It has uh, it contributes to twenty eight percent of last year's NPME, and then. Uh, the subsidiary is uh, PT Federal Karyatama. It produces two-wheeler lubricant since 1998, <coughs> and uh, currently it has more than 13,000 outlets in Indonesia, and 23% of market share for automotive lubricant market. But performance last year for this segment has been quite flat at 12.3% uh, year-on-year, to about 1.44 trillion rupiah. Uh, this was due to lower repacking volume. 
Now this year, uh, MPMX is planning to introduce, or actually they have already introduced the Ymatic product uh, to tap into the fast-growing automatic transition uh, transmission two-wheeler market. Uh, it also has begun producing four-wheeler Rubicon uh, currently in bulk and uh, aims to be the genuine oil for Nissan cars in the country. In auto services, <coughs> the company provides uh, car rental and lease services. Uh, the subsidiary for this business is MPM Rent, uh, which was acquired uh, in 2012. And then uh, it has currently 34 outlets nationwide and about uh, 1,400 corporate clients. It is the second largest car rental and dealer company in Indonesia. And then the fleet uh, in last year was about uh, more than 13,500 units of uh, car for rent. Uh, this uh, segment has a staggering performance last year, in which the PAT or profit after tax grow uh, jumped 159 percent uh, in 2013. Uh, that was following a 69 percent uh, fleet size expansion carried out by the company. So uh, the figure 13,502 units was uh, after they expanded their fleet size by 69 percent from a year earlier. Key customers for uh, car rentals of MPMX includes Panasonic, uh, L'Oreal uh, Indonesia, and then uh, Bank Central Asia, uh, which is a listed uh, bank in Indonesia, Bank BTPN, and then Aerotrans, ULB Indonesia, Commonwealth Bank, DHL, Bridgestone, and Cement Indonesia. These are the, the corporate clients for car rental segments of MPMX. Uh, the next segment for MPMX is the financial services segment, which contributes to uh, the 20% of uh, FY13 uh, profit after tax and minority interest. There is a turnaround for this segment in financial services because of increasing new bookings and profitability. In 2011, uh, we can see that uh, the company actually uh, booked net loss for this segment instead of net profit so they suffer from net loss after tax uh, in 2011 yeah but uh, in 2012 and 13 there was a turnaround that uh, now it booked a profit after tax now this is due to uh, growth in new bookings from both uh, two-wheel and four-wheel financing and also network expansion and higher lending rates in uh, financial services, the company has uh, three subsidiaries, which is SAF, uh, they finance two-wheel uh, purchases, and then NPM finance in four-wheel financing, and then NPM insurance, uh, which uh, insured four-wheel, two-wheel cargo and property insurance, is a non-life insurance company. And uh, since there are a lot of bookings, in uh, more bookings in 2013, there has been a turnaround from net loss after tax to net profit after tax for this segment. Uh, this is a comparison table for MPMX compared to a few other companies that has uh, in similar industry, including Indomobile Success International uh, and then uh, Tunas Ridian of uh, auto financing companies and uh, Astra International, which is uh, the largest auto companies in Indonesia. Uh, PE wise, Mitra has uh, is has one of the lowest PE. In fact, uh, if we compare to the average, it's quite low at eight point uh, nineteen times. Uh, but it has quite good return on equity, which is eighteen point four percent. The company uh, is not distributing dividends yet because they are quite new. Uh, they just been listed, and they, uh, we believe that they still need uh, their cash and earnings. Uh, for further expansion. So uh, we heard from the management also that they still don't have the plan to uh, give dividends to investors. Uh, but uh, we see that this company has huge uh, growth potential ahead. Uh, lastly, but not least, this is uh, the uh, SWOT analysis for NPMX, uh, in which it has 
quite good synergy synergy across uh, the business segments uh, which balances out business volatility and it is, it is also the leader in uh, two-wheel market in East Java and East Nusa Tenggara area. Uh, well, for uh, investment, uh, sorry, not investment, but uh, for weakness is that it's depending uh, on two-wheeler and four-wheeler manufacturing companies, including Asra International. Since they are not manufacturer, they are distributor of uh, two-wheeler and four-wheeler in Indonesia. Okay, uh, with that, we wrap up our presentation for uh, Indonesian market, uh, which uh, we try to relate to uh, the political theme this year. So uh, to summarize the uh, presentation, we think that uh, both presidential candidates have quite opposing views about how to lead the country. Prabowo would uh, have a top-down view uh, while uh, Joko Widodo will have a bottom-up view. And then in terms of uh, political belief, I think that Prabowo uh, is more uh, a nationalist right-wing uh, politician and then uh, Jokowi is more a moderate uh, left politician. And uh, sectors that will benefit from uh, election momentum this year are infrastructure, construction, and also uh, basic industry sector where, which comprises largely of cement industry and uh, Mitra Adip, uh, not Mitra Adipakasa, sorry, Mitra Pinastika Mustika, uh, an automotive company that we initiated uh, with buy recommendation we believe that it has future growth potential and this company is worth investing. Thank you and good afternoon.